Good afternoon. I was pleasantly surprised when I walked out the door to come to, 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 come to church because I expected it to be cold and it was a pretty decent day out there so far. So welcome to First Congregational Church of Norman, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you, you are welcome here. here. My name's Louise Whitaker, and I'm a member here at, at First Congregational. And we'd like to welcome everyone here today, whether you're in person or joining us online. Uh, Reverend, Reverend Robin Myers will, will be providing today's sermon, and we look forward to having you join us in person or online for today's service. I think everyone has been here before, so you know the, the ritual. Um, on your bulletin, there's a little perforated edge. If you'll just tear that off, we can all do it now so that we don't make noise later. Or, and if you will just put your, uh, your name. If you'd like to give us any other contact information, that would be great. If you have any uh, concerns, uh, just, just mark those. If you would like someone from the church to contact you, just indicate that on, on, on your little card. And you can uh, drop that in the offering plate. It doesn't look like we have any announcements today. I am excited that we're using the New Century Hymnal today. I know everyone, uh, if you, you should have gotten one when you came in. And we would ask, if, if, it, if, if you think about it, to take it back out and put it on the cart when you leave so that we don't have to, to wander around and, and pick them all up. That would, that would help, help greatly. Do any of you have, are there any announcements that anyone would like to share? Okay, I will read the, 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 the prayer bowl three times. Allow each ring to, to expand your awareness of the sacred, of the sacred and become, become fully present in this place at this time. Open your hearts and your minds to God and remember your, think about those, pers those things and people that, that, that are dear to you and those things that you have concerns about. Please locate the, the call to, to worship that's printed in your bulletin and rise in, in body or in spirit as you are able. I will read the sections in plain print and would you please read aloud uh, the sections in bold. We gather to fill the empty spaces in our lives. We gather to share our lives of trouble. We gather to encourage one another. Breathe into us, Holy Spirit, Holy hope, faith, faith, and joy. Breathe into us wisdom of Jesus, compassion, compassion truth, and holiness. Breathe into us, Holy One, reconciliation, justice, and peace. Amen. And if you'll remain standing for hymn number 395.
Please be seated. Nothing like singing hymns through a mask. Hi, Norman. How is everybody? I hope you are well and staying safe and enjoying the sunshine. It is nicer out there than I thought it was going to be. So um, let's bow our heads and I'll offer a prayer. Lord of life, we set aside this weekend to remember the life of Martin Luther King Jr. It is so easy as the years pass to forget what the struggle of his life was all about. He was a real human being, not a plaster saint, and his moment on earth had lethal consequences that he could see coming. Endowed with eloquence, he was also afflicted with the consequences of truth-telling. Now that we have some safe distance from his words, we call him a prophet and name streets after him. But at the time, Dr. King was, as many believed at the time, just stirring up trouble in the South, or was a communist, or was committed to social anarchy. But in truth, the nation was deceiving itself about equality and its own unfulfilled promises. We knew what was wrong, but we preferred that way to what is right because we are creatures of comfort and we do not choose suffering for ourselves, even as we look away from the suffering of others. Thanks be to God for those who will not let us turn our gaze away until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Amen. We enter into a time of joys and concerns and we start with joys that we just share out loud if you are, are so moved. What are some of the joys this community has to offer? The wind stopped blowing. I'm, say it again. The wind stopped blowing. The wind blowing. And for the winds in Oklahoma not to blow, <laughs> let the people say, thanks be to God. Linda, were you going to say something? Same thing. Same thing. Beautiful day. Yes. Any other joys you want to share? It's for the joy of being here in this small but mighty community, let the people say, thanks be to God. As a visitor to be so welcome. As a visitor to feel so welcome for this important aspect of a congregation, let the people say, thanks be to God. And for the New Century Hymnal, I said last week, wouldn't it be nice if we could sing from the New Century Hymnal and boom, here it is. You, you guys are good. Yes. I already saw it at lunch today. I can see the students are coming back. The students are coming back. For the students returning to Norman, let the people say, thanks be to God. Drives the whole economy, right? <laughs> That's right. Any other joys? All right, then as we bow our heads, if you would just say a name, uh, a situation, uh, a place that means something, maybe only to you, but that is enough, and we will hold it in prayer. Let's bow our heads together. John. Billy Myers. Lana. Don Robinson. Hear these prayers, Holy One, and let the people whose names we spoke aloud feel our love and our presence and any action we might take on their behalf. Let's hold each other and join together in saying the Lord's Prayer, a version of which is printed in our morning bulletin. Our Creator, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For you reign in the power that is love, now and always. Amen. The scripture lesson on which most uh, preachers who follow the New Common Lectionary are preaching today is in John's Gospel, the second chapter, verses 1 to 11, and some of you like to follow along as I'm reading, so consult the Bible uh, in your pews. This is the wedding at Cana. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Here ends this reading, inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Sometimes the distance uh, that separates us as modern readers of the Bible from the time in which it was written is so vast that the meaning of the text gets lost, or sometimes people will alter it to fit a theological agenda. The story of Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana is a perfect example. To get behind the text, first we have to get out of our own time and place long enough to imagine what life was like in the first century. For most of human history, before the invention of artificial light, beings, human beings took the winter solstice very seriously. They thought the sun was being eaten up and might go away and never come back. And so the Incas tried to tie it down the sun, that is. The Zoroastrians stayed up all night and read poetry. Wild women tore the god Dionysus to pieces and ate him. There are, according to a source I consulted, quote, winter solstice rituals that involved pig snouts, ghosts, and the river Nile turning into wine. And it was that last one that interested me. That great river that splits Egypt in half and brought life to that ancient civilization in the form of water gets turned into wine. What an amazing image. But then remember, in the middle of winter, people were frightened by the darkness. Vitamin D is waning, which everyone needs. Serotonin is depleted. The body grows achy and tired. We know this. Most people got sick just as we do now with the flu or with COVID, and what people longed for was the light. Perhaps also a little dancing, some good stories, and some really good wine. And since the church co-opted every pagan ritual it could get its ecclesiastical hands on, the Feast of Epiphany took the date that coincided with the Isis festival 
an ancient Egyptian goddess of fertility, the Romans took the feast days and layered over them the Eucharistic meal of Jesus. The season of Epiphany may be on the surface about the wise men arriving at the manger, but at a much deeper level, it was once about how we respond as people of faith to the darkness. What do we do with the darkness? Whether that's physical darkness or the never-ending night of human suffering. And so in this strange and mystical gospel of John, so different from the other three gospels, Jesus is not born in a manger with angels and shepherds and visited by wise men, but has always existed with God. He was pre-existed, grew up in God's house, if you will, had his own room, and then pays a visit to earth to save us all from the darkness of spiritual ignorance. He was the light of all people, said John. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. In John, whose theology is saturated with Gnosticism, there are the children of darkness, and there are the children of light, and Jesus is the light. His message is to open our eyes. So when does Nicodemus come to visit Jesus? At night a symbol of the darkness in which he lives as yet unenlightened. And Jesus tells him he must be born from where? From above. That is, reborn into the light. A Samaritan woman at the well who's had many husbands draws water, and Jesus talks about living water. The disciples get hungry, and Jesus says, well, you're hungry for regular bread, but I'll give you bread from heaven. I am that bread. Don't work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. This is how John works on two levels. What's on the earth and what's running above the earth. Two separate spheres, parallel realities. The world we see and experience and then the world of the spirit. And this is not a problem, of course, unless we begin to, well, literalize this language. Take the now infamous text where Jesus is reported to have said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Evangelicals who preach the vast majority of their sermons from the Gospel of John, did you know, say that means you have to be a Christian believer to go to heaven. But if this is a metaphor, like all the others, then it could just as easily mean that no one comes to the light but by living the light as I have shown it to you. Our problem is that we have literalized so many metaphors in service to exclusivity. Of course, Jesus may be the bread of life, but let's remember there's nothing wrong with providing people with real bread. The historical Jesus gave us a now famous prayer about real bread saying, Give us this day our daily bread. That's actual bread, he was talking about, in a world that lived on the edge of starvation and in which the promise of tomorrow was given to no one. I think that for Jesus, as for all prophets, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the vast inequities and injustices of the world, they stank in the nostrils of God. And I think that before we get all spiritual about bread, we should first concentrate on getting enough of the real thing to more people. When you go to a food shelter and you're hungry, you don't want symbolic fried chicken or metaphorical pie. You don't want to give people who are freezing a virtual coat to warm their souls, but a nice parka and a nice pair of gloves to warm their bodies, yes? When it comes to this famous story of Jesus turning water into wine, notice that in John's gospel, this story comes first. We're only to chapter two. And all that's happened so far is Jesus has appeared, gotten baptized, and recruited some disciples, and boom, we're at a wedding party. Jesus has arrived, so let the celebration begin. And don't think for a minute that the image of a wedding is coincidental. Weddings are not just a big deal today because they're often so elaborate and expensive and consumed by showmanship. 
but they were an even bigger deal in the ancient Near East. They lasted for days. Dowries were being negotiated. I think our daughter's worth more than that. Torchlight parades were held. The, the bridegroom would come late to the feast on purpose just to draw out the drama. And someone would say, the bridegroom is here, but he didn't appear. That's another parable. And there was food, and there was wine, and there was feasting. And I'm telling you, lots of food, lots of wine, lots of dancing. If any of you have been watching the four-part Netflix series, Unorthodox, you know how elaborate Jewish weddings were. And the subtext that ran underneath every wedding was life itself, sex and passion and the possibility of pregnancy colliding with the possibility of impotence and disappointment and sterility. So these big blowout weddings were about sending these two off to their wedding bed with a great fertility blessing from the whole community. So the dancing, the wine, the choreographed separation of the bride and groom until the very last minute, it was all a kind of social, religious, and tribal form of foreplay. Mm -hmm. The community was saying, we want this to work. And by work, we mean we want children. We want the blessing that is the future as a sign of God's favor. So here, have a little more wine. This is also why a, a sort of palpable anxiety hung over every wedding in those days. Because the joy of a wedding brings into stark contrast the fears that hang over this absurd promise, this impossible promise people are making. For better or worse, richer or poor, sickness and in health, till death do us part. Are you kidding? How about just till I'm not getting what I need? And then, not three sentences into our story, the mother of Jesus says, they have no wine. This is not what you want to hear at a wedding in those days. It was a death sentence. And here is the first glimpse we have into John's Gospel of Mary, and it's hardly sweetness and light. One scholar put it this way, she isn't a naive young mother gazing adoringly into the eyes of her sweet infant. She's more like an irritable, menopausal Jewish lady kvetching to her unmarried, unemployed son. Oy vey, they have no wine. And, and doesn't his reply sound strange? Woman, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? Woman, uh, who calls his mother woman? Sounds a little rude and dismissive to me, doesn't it to you? Yeah. This has bothered lots of Bible commentaries, commentators who have then bent over backwards to assure us, well, this does not really indicate impatience or disrespect on the part of Jesus. But I know of no mother who would not at that moment wring her son's neck. What do I have to do with you? You're kidding me, right? Where shall I start with the DNA? The milk from my breast that kept you alive. Those sweet diaper changes in the middle of the night. What do I have to do with you? To be honest, I think this is the writer of John's Gospel working on the al alternate reality that we've already said runs under the ordinary world and that people just don't get, especially the next line. Jesus says, my hour's not yet come. So he says, in effect, what do I look like, the wine steward? Am I supposed to make a run to 7-Eleven? Hey, this is pre-existent Jesus you're talking to here, not the caterer. But Mary's got more important things on her mind, like getting more wine to the party and fast. So she tells her servants to listen to what Jesus tells them to do. He then orders them to fill the containers that hold the water used for, listen carefully, purifying. Those are the big pots of water that are used for washing one's hands in a religious subculture where such purity rituals were much more than just good hygiene. Here is where serious Bible study really pays off. Imagine our modern equivalent, the now omnipresent hand sanitizer pump bottles. 
in hospitals, schools, at work. Freshen up, people. There are COVID germs everywhere. Now, what if someone came along and filled those dispensers with wine? Good wine. Really good wine. A Malbec, from where I, my tastes come from. So, so good, in fact, that the steward remarks that everything is backwards here. People usually serve the good wine first before people get drunk and don't care what the wine tastes like. But now we get the good wine, and of course, for John's Jesus, he is the new wine, not the old wine of the first covenant, but the new wine of the new covenant. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, right? So now that Jesus, the new wine, has come, it's not about the old purity codes anymore, but about extravagant, joyful abundance. Jesus is here. Let's celebrate. Now, growing up, I heard preachers tell us this story is yet another example of how Jesus would become a miraculous alchemist for anyone who believed in him. And he could turn water into wine, and I can't do that, and you can't do that. I took from this story that Jesus fixes things, solves problems, keeps the party going. But now, I hear it as a story that could be deeply offensive to those whose purity rituals represented by those purification jars, are being replaced by a reign of excess. Excessive joy, excessive generosity, excessive and amazing grace. That's a good word for Christianity, excessive. Imagine, if you will, waking up one morning and going into the bathroom and turning on the tap water and out comes wine, good wine. And you're thinking to yourself, hey, I just wanted to brush my teeth here. This is a story about the love of God flowing into our lives with such unexpected joy that it replaces even our most sensible rituals. We know how the world is supposed to work, but God has something else in mind, and it is radically, unpredictably, even offensively excessive. Dr. King said once, every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. We have become a society of both rampant narcissism and pathological selfishness. Watching Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema hold up a voting rights bill that could be the only thing now that stands between us and the end of our democracy tells me they each care more for their own careers and their fortunes than they care about the most sacred tenet of democracy, the right to vote. Dr. King is turning over in his grave. My wife, Sean, had a brother who had Down syndrome. He died in 2012. And at the funeral, I happened to look across the street, and there was one of these gigantic pickup trucks. Some of these trucks are large, you know, and it had a bumper sticker that read, Ayn Rand was right. That was the bumper sticker. Meaning, he agrees with the philosophy that says there are only two kinds of people in the world. This was Ayn Rand's philosophy. There are the producers, and there are the moochers. And we are not our brother or sister's keeper, so let everyone rise or fall as he or she is able, period. How ironic, I thought, standing at the graveside of a funeral of a family member who was born with a missing chromosome, wasn't his fault, who benefited his whole life by both a loving family and the programs made possible by the special people at the Starkey Foundation in Wichita, a school for the disabled funded by state and federal dollars that represents our collective compassion for people who cannot fend for themselves. Ayn Rand would say he's on his own. And perhaps Ayn Rand, who did not have children, normal or disabled, did not quite grasp what it means to need help. The collapse of the NRA, the National Rifle Association, into a cesspool of corruption proved what they have always been and what Jesus would call them if he were here today, a brood of vipers. 
They know that after every mass shooting, gun sales go up, so they protect the lethal weapons that are killing so many of us while putting more and more money into their pockets. It's not more complicated than that. Ayn Rand was not right. She was wrong. We need both a collective conscience and a collective ethic, said Dr. King, because life is not cheap and our children are not expendable. We have it on good authority from the man whose name falls so easily from our lips around here, Jesus of Nazareth, that appearances can be deceiving. He is saying to us in this story, look again into those clay pots that you use for purification, to wash and to stay pure on the outside. Look at what business as usual has done to the wedding party of life. You can be clean, but still be mean. You can drink all the good wine first, and then when it runs out, you can go home and let the little people clean up with the cheap wine. But God wants something different to come out of your heart. As it says in the sermon title, you can be clean on the outside and dirty on the inside. This weekend is a time for national reflection and confession. Forgive us, Lord for our apathy and indifference. Forgive us for our long and tortured history of colonialism and racism. Forgive us for our greed and the way it has stolen bread from the poor. Forgive us for the wars we fought to make sure our good wine never runs out. Forgive us for thinking that some deserve what they have while others deserve to suffer. Forgive us for blaming others when tragedy strikes. Forgive us, Lord, for turning wine into water and then using it to wash our hands of the world. You all remember how Dr. King said this, don't you? Don't you remember how it sounded? I say to you today, my friends, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream today. That one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of oppression, sweltering with the heat of injustice, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by their content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down, down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope, said Dr. King. This is the faith that I go back to the south with, he said. With this faith, we'll be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we'll be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we'll be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing we will be free one day. And this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my father died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is to become a great nation, <coughs> this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. 
Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we'll be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, Say it with me, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Perhaps if it was not obvious, Dr. King changed my life. And I thought, he's a preacher. Hmm. And now for the work of this church, this community, and throughout the only world we have, we're bringing forth the contributions you have made. And if you would please stand and sing the doxology.
eye contact with someone, we'll sing our response together. Let's go with a word of prayer. And now may the power of God and the peace of our teacher, Jesus of Nazareth, which really does pass all our understanding, go with every one of us, abiding in us, lifting us up, and making us whole. Go in peace, pray for peace, wage a little peace, and love one another, every single other. Amen. <laughs>